There are only two hard problems in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. That was a quote from Phil Carlton. Uh, he, he used to be an engineer in Mozilla. But there's a, a true statement to that. Caching is one of the most difficult problems. You know, we have caching everywhere. We have caching at the lowest level in the CPU. We have three levels of caching for that matter. You know, it depends on how many cores you have. Cores share a certain cache level, you know, L3 cache. Even a core itself has its own low level cache. You go up and level, there is an operating system cache. You go higher level, the application has a cache. If you're building a backend application, you can have literally many, many, many layers of caching, you know, and, uh, and you do caching to prevent the cost of calculating or computing certain item, which is sometimes inevitable, you need to cache things because the cost of computing that item is just so high, you know, it's just easier to calculate a value and then cache it so that clients can consume the cache. The problem becomes how I invalidate the cache in case of something new just popped up. But what I want to discuss in this episode of the Back Engineering Show, actually an article from Forum, the uh, open source community uh, authoring platform. Uh, they wrote a fantastic article about caching, the three level of caching, just three. They, they apparently use three. And it is very rare that you find such an honest, you know, detailed article about how really vulnerable we are in engineers. We don't really talk about our bugs that we find. We rarely talk about that. But that article, you know, is very detailed, very to the bone. It gives you exactly what the bugs they run into when they are caching and all the levels of the caching. So what I want to do is, is talk about this article, go through it a little bit, and then finally give you uh, some of the mistakes that we do. Uh, how, how we rush into caching, unfortunately, very quickly. How about we jump into it? All right, this comes from Jeremy Friesen. It's a dev from Forum. You know, I don't know if... Uh, uh, let me know in the comments if you're using this platform. I, I, actually, the first time I hear about this. So they're using uh, Rails as their backend programming language. And uh, uh, this is a quick tour of our favorite performance enhancing pain points. In Forum code base, we make extensive use of various caching strategies. And as with any cache, we always run into the risk of not invalidating the right caches. Is the worst thing I personally run into my own sets of problem with caching. And boy, it's nasty. You know, especially if you have like multiple backend that are running and each backend have multiple processes and the process has that cache. So if your request comes in and hits that, hits a fresh process, you don't see the bug. But if you do the request again and it hit that right bad cache process, then you hit the bug. And these are the nastiest, undeterm non-deterministic bugs, you know. And you only find it if you really know the entire stack and you can inject certain things, you know. I found it by actually injecting a special uh, header in the request, which end up in my database log. And that's the only way I found it, actually. But regardless, this might be another video. So the three strategies that I found are edge caching, rails caching, database caching. So, so this is what they're using. I believe there are many others. Uh, we can go through this in detail. I mean, in, in summary, so we don't have to read everything here. But edge caching is effectively, uh, you know, especially if you have static documents, you want these documents to sit as close as possible to the client, you know? So the, there's a client in India and your servers in the US, and you're serving your HTML files, you want that HTML files to live next to the client so you don't take the hit to go all the way latency wise, right? So typically how do you do edge caching is use use the, the popular CDNs, you know, like Fastly or I believe Cloudflare also a CDN can can act like a CDN. Or you can build your own edge cache using Nginx or any other reverse proxy. But the thing you, that you need to understand here is you're giving your CDN, that's uh, sadly not a lot of people understand this. You're giving the CDN full access to your content. They see everything, you know, because they have to decrypt the content. And you might be fine with that. 
but just understand that this happens you know fortunately this is, there is no escape from that right you're giving them the ability to decrypt the content and look at it in order to cache it otherwise they cannot cache encrypted content yeah unless homomorphic encryption is a thing in the future hopefully it comes in but yeah so that's edge caching edge caching now is evolved into the you can break the document into the static part versus the dynamic part and only cache the static parts and components stuff that you know i don't really uh, i'm not really well versed on and this is they actually explain how they can break these response documents into fragments and only cache the document uh part of the documents effectively no, the second part is the Rails caching, which is your whatever your server level application backend caching. And the final one is database caching here. So in a case where your database is relational and uh, you you have a normalized data model where you need to join stuff together, especially if you don't uh, you did not author your queries in a predictable manner, uh, queries can get slow with joins especially if you have an unbalanced, you know, uh, joining predicate and you don't have the proper indexes in the place. Joins can get really nasty and can slow things down. Sometimes, especially with hash joins, you don't, if you're hashing the wrong, or the wrong side of the equation, you, you will take more time building the join instead of actually performing the query itself you know preparing for the join just building the hash instead of actually doing that because you you really need to select the smaller side when it's when it comes to hashing and you don't want it to be too big and you don't want it to be too small you know because otherwise you don't you don't really get another a lot, a lot of benefits so database caching so what they do here at this specifically is they have they added fields in the master table i believe it's called the article tables with the information that they would have rather joined you know so in case of an update they would go and update these tables so there's a cost a little bit so if someone changed their name obviously you have to hit the cost and update their name in all their your tables right nothing is free in this world unfortunately anything you do there is a side effect so yeah, let's go through this response document and fragments the response document is a single file sent from the server in response to a request as i'm walking through this remember that when you see rendered in your browser when you see rendered in your browser is almost always from a combination of from many response documents sent to the server you know so any all the documents is actually the document that you get is just a, it, it's assembled effectively from multiple requests and that's for a good reason i believe they do this so that they cache the parts that is changing that that's not changing while they can effectively dynamically calculate the stuff that that does change listing the correct strategy they're talking about the things that we just discussed edge caching trying to put as many response documents as close to the clients we talked about that they're using fastly or nginx so both right and then rails caching so this is the in memory i believe cache they didn't they didn't mention if this is in memory or not but it's uh, effectively we we use the rails caching to store all kinds of things mostly fragments that we use to build the response document so the fragments themselves that the edge requests are cached in the rail caching so uh so and, and they are tagged that's the, the beauty of this they are uniquely tagging these fragments with article id article last modified date this is really good that means if you if you do request an older article you'll always get it because you're sending the article updated by time updated at effectively right so if the article doesn't get updated the edge cache need to get notified that hey we updated this article so there is a communication between the edge and the rails and it's unfortunately not not described here uh, but the edge does communicate with the origin server which is the real server to get the latest stuff how frequently is it a push mechanism i have no idea to be honest you no know? but there's many ways you can implement it uh, one way i believe the edge would pull after every few seconds 
to see if there is an update version asynchronously that is right it's like without any request the second approach is for the origin to push content to the edge that doesn't sound like a good idea to to be honest pushing is always the last solution to things like it. people i've seen kafka move away from push to long polling it's because it, push is unpredictable you know if you push something you have no idea if the client can handle it or not yeah i don't know guys what do you think let me know database caching my favorite thing the last is database caching we cache an article tag list user and organization information if applicable so the organization fields the username the tag list like what did you tag and this changed a lot the tag by the way so if if you don't cache this what will happen you'll have to if you want to read the query you'll always have to join with the tag list my god i don't want to look at the table that is called article tag again they don't mention that here but i'm assuming there will be a table called article tags you know that table is massive you know and i, I the indexing strategy has to be has re, need to be authored in a very delicate way to fetch this so you would cache the art uh, you would index the article id in this case because you're always searching by the article id but sometimes you're going to search by the tag right what does that mean if you're searching by the tag then you really need to tell me the article id and that yeah it's 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 gonna be really nasty building an application is not easy if you need to think about all that stuff right yeah so it's, if you want to fetch an article, let's say that again. If I want to fetch an article and fetch all its tags, again, let's not do any caching here. I need to go to the article ID and I need to join with that article tags table and then pull all the tags. I, I know the article ID. I need to index on the article ID on the other table. Right? Uh, that That's fine. And that that's that's an instantaneous, right? Give me article IDs. Assume the article ID will have a couple of tags, you know, that shouldn't be that bad you know and i don't know if they have an actual it's a it is the one-to-one -one with a tag like article id one has i don't know software engineering article id one has i don't know uh, database engineering article id one also is uh javascript you know is it like that or is it just one versus a, a comma separated you know all these decisions you need to make them as a backend engineer a database engineer in this case which is your job as well at the end of the day but boy there is unlimited ways you can implement things and everyone has a pros and cons and we can sit here and, and argue and think about that but yeah joining regardless otherwise if you search by tag oh my god you need to index the tag create a separate index right but you you can't really do a composite index here unfortunately because when you search by tag hey you give me all the articles that mentions javascript you know you don't know the article id so you can't use a composite id article id tag because the moment you search by the tag id uh, you're using the right hand side of the composite and that won't use the index that will not use the index say so you need multiple indexes one for this and one for this so yeah they're they're right to move that uh, as just another i don't know if you need a table for that to be honest just just put it as a field and update that every time as just another field in the article table itself so that they don't avoid this join that means you're responsible whoever updates that is responsible to update those caches you know the fields yesterday i reported an issue where changing an organization image should invalidate the associated articles cached organization yeah so that's the bug so they should change the organization image if you change the image right the image is an organization table right and the all articles now reference this organization image right so you need to kind of it's a it's a it's a wild change that's one benefit of the join you know if you change that thing the join will pick it up but if you cache then you're responsible for updating the cache it's it's a double-edged sword right the caching 
All right, so just to summarize, so the bug they, the forum team ran into uh, was uh, an outdated uh, attribute in the database table itself, where they're fetching, they were, where they're storing the cached attributes in the article table. And since they are storing that, the actual values left in another table, and they were never updated that effectively that cache when the operation happened so they thought first it's at the edge cache so they busted through the edge cache uh they they, they thought it's the rails cache they busted through the rail cache but eventually the, the bug persisted you still see the old image of the organization and that's basically it's like oh why why am i seeing the old image still what what's happened to the new image right and when you see that it turns out to be the field in the database that you need to update, right? If you maintain a cache, you have to first learn how to invalidate it and uh, know all the entry points where you need to invalidate it. And that can become really nasty. Yeah, so I think I think it's still uh, worthwhile reading this article and just understand that it's just three layers. But what if you have even more than that, you know? Uh, what I would say is caching is is an amazing tool and it is required, I believe. In most cases, you need to add a layer of cache to improve the performance. However, what we see, unfortunately, is caching is being treated as a cop-out where, hey, let's just cache. Hey, this query is slow. Let's just cache. And I think that's not a necessarily a good attitude to have for an engineer why because you're taking the short uh, you're taking the shortcut where you're not uh, instead of actually diagnosing why something is slow you effectively just decided to cache it the fix might be a lot one single line of code to know why this thing is slow to begin with and instead of adding bloat or maybe unnecessary at all you know another layer which increases the complexity because we just we just saw how complex caching is with this article right so adding just another caching layer on top of something that is performing poorly is not a good idea you know it's bad practice because instead of you challenging yourself to figure out why this thing is slow to begin with, you've just taken the short route and just less cash and add complexity. Some, my I say, unnecessary complexity for most cases. You, you might tune this query or rearrange it to be a few microseconds instead of five seconds. And you'll be off without needing even to cache. I have to say that sometimes the optimization can hit a wall. Like in the CPU, there's a physical distance at the end of the day between layer uh, zero and layer three and the RAM. And while this distance is getting shorter and shorter, you know, just like taking, going to the memory and back is physically slower than going directly in place to get the value right so there is sometimes physical limitation that you can't do anything about right while guess what apple actually broke that limit recently with uh, apple m1 not the m1 the m1 ultra they created this bridge that fused together i believe intel has worked and amd worked on something similar i'm i'm, I'm not really well versed in the cpu areas but they bridged that gap they fixed that so now uh, going to the ram is as fast as going to the cache almost as fast not as fast but it's almost as fast so so now they fix the core problem you know so and we engineers should really think about that you know why are we adding the cache to begin with oh but just because the uh, query is slow well why is it slow if you can articulate well articulate why something is slow then by all means and you say hey there is no solution or it's not feasible for me to solve this because of these limitations 
because the database doesn't offer me this and this and that, then sure, you can definitely say that. But if you don't know why something is slow and then you add a cache layer, I think I think we need to do better than that, right? But that's just my opinion. You might agree or disagree, obviously, with me, right? Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this. Let me know in the comment section below. Again, fantastic article, I believe. Uh, I'm going to reference it below. I think everyone should read it. Uh, but what do you think, guys? Did you run into caching woos, I believe, problems? Let me know in the comment section below. I'm going to see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome. Goodbye.